Welcome, folks, to Last Week I Learned with Jimmy Saran. This week, as usual, we have five articles and one idea. Now, let's dive right in. The first article is titled, Some Tactics for Writing in Public. One of my favorite things about really great writing is it's incredibly practical. And this one is just so well done. I think there's certainly a place for what I would call, I guess, deep dives, where it's all about you know, the theory of writing. And those are super interesting. But what I really loved about this one, it was all about the practice and specifically the practice of writing online in public, right? That's kind of like silently in the title, but not there. I want to read one quote that I found really useful and that I'll be trying to bring into this blog. The author said, often in my blog posts, I ask technical questions that I don't know the answer to. This helps people focus their replies a little bit. An obvious comment to make is to provide an answer to the question or explain the thing I didn't know. I think it's really smart to start shaping dialogue in your online platforms. I don't have comments at this point. At some point, I'd love to add them. But this really gets me thinking about how to direct people and kind of guide people. Kind of thinking about my blog posts as parties that I'm hosting and what do I want the decor to look like? Where do I want to point people? That was just one of the really interesting points I found in this one. Next up is... The monster, atomic bomb, that was too big to use. This one was almost hard to believe. I struggled to put myself in the Cold War. I think I struggled to feel it experientially and understand what it must have been like to feel a real threat for a nuclear war. I mean, I feel like I've had a hint of that recently. There's been a little bit more likelihood of that. But I think what we experienced in the Cold War is something incredibly unique and kind of world changing is uh, is these weapons that could you know destroy a whole city or more and i think it was just a really interesting look at one of my favorite words right now a counterfactual which is like a different way history could have played out i think this is a really really fascinating one to look into but i'm going to read the quick quote real quick and then we'll move on to the next one the soviets had built a weapon so powerful that they were unwilling to test it at its full capacity. And that was only one of the problems with this devastating device. I mean, that's wild. You couldn't even test it because it would be so devastating. All right, third one. Do you guys ever think about dying? So this is written by Bobby Hundreds. I listened to him, I think, on the Tim Ferriss show and absolutely adored his way of thinking. He is the founder of a streetwear brand and... I'm just consistently impressed with the breadth of his thought and the depth of it. I I just really find him a really wonderful thinker. I love reading his writing, and this piece did not disappoint. So this is in reference to Barbie. There's a kind of famous scene in it where she says, do you ever think about dying in the middle of a party? And the party just kind of shuts down. And I think the author really makes an interesting point out of this. And I'm just going to read the quote and go from there. Statistically, I'm unsure if there is more death or less death or the equal amount of death, but I do know that we are more aware than ever of death. And I just never gave thought to this, but it's undeniably true. I mean, we see death all the time in movies, on the news, even just around us. I mean, having a citizen app is something I choose consciously not to do because I would be even more aware of death around me. I think there's a great statistics about the number of relationships we're able to hold in our head and the size of, you know, cities and towns way back thousands of years ago was like 150. That was the most, you know, number of people you keep in your head. And when you think about that and when you think about death on that scale, I mean, one of the things I've learned watching Korean dramas and reading a bunch of Korean literature is that there's this tradition of taking multiple days to mourn a death. And when I read this article, I immediately thought about that and thought about what if in our communities we took multiple days to mourn each death? I mean, we would never do anything other than mourning. And that's kind of a shocking thought to have. I think it's hard to wrap our heads around how much we are aware of death as compared to our ancestors. And there's nuance here, right? In some ways, we're more separate from death than ever. We don't see it happen as often. But it happens and we're aware of it way more often, even if we're not physically there. So I just thought this had a lot of interesting thoughts and it really is making me think about how I want to deal with death going forward. 
what kind of rituals I want to have in place and how I can kind of try to find an appropriate balance about how much death I'm exposed to. Very different topic. Next up is real world engineering challenges. Number six, migrations. Very abrupt change. My younger brother has a great joke about Instagram stories where people will have, you know, like condolences to someone who died and then they'll have like a party, you know, in their story just back to back. This kind of feels like that moment. I really love any time I get to see the nitty gritty, right? So we talked about this with that first article, Writing in Public. This is kind of the tech equivalent. And I, one, I just think it's really remarkable reporting that's done in this newsletter. I really find this newsletter super helpful. They're always talking to real world sources and really you know, significant ones. I mean, this article has, I think, six different huge companies that you would recognize, Pinterest being one of them, and how they dealt with what's called a migration, right? When we think about software, we think it's malleable and changeable, right? And we think about it different than a building, right? We think, like, when you think about a remodeling of a building, you know that's a big task. When you think about moving data from one place to another, you don't really think of it as a big task, but it is, and that was a misconception I had kind of when I started my work. A lot of my work now is literally just moving data from one place to another. It's very difficult and time-consuming and tricky. And I think this article is worth reading just to understand migrations because I think they're such an important part of companies. These are like black swan moments. These can make or break a company, especially when it comes to like a startup. When you think about startups moving fast and breaking things, well, at a certain point, things can't break anymore. And that means you have to migrate to some sort of stable platform. And it's very hard to do. And we're kind of seeing it play out with, you know, Twitter. Twitter's trying to do a migration, a cultural one and a technical one, and it's very difficult. And so I, I found this really relevant to the times and very, very interesting and very real world. So I hope you enjoy it. Our last article of the week is Benedict's newsletter number 500. I don't really know who Benedict is, but I read his newsletter every single week. And I find his thinking incredibly important. And I want to read, I think I'm going to summarize this quote because it's a little long. But I thought this was mind-blowing that I hadn't thought about it. He talked about the move from internal combustion engines to electric cars. I think this is an idea that Neil and I talked about a lot, which is levers, right? We talked about like big changes that will fundamentally alter reality, right? And thinking about those. And I think this is a great example of a lever that I've never thought about. Now, what I find really interesting here is the implications of this transition. Because I hadn't thought about it. When you think about an internal combustion engine and, and an internal combustion car, the number of parts are staggering. And when you really look into the manufacturing process, it's really complicated. There is so much going on. Um, each part is you know, contracted out from a different place. There's so much testing that happens. There's just so much, not fat necessarily, but process that has to happen. And when you think about electric cars, if you take away the engine, you take away most of the complexity. You take away a lot of the complexity in the powertrain. It's just a simpler machine on electric cars. And what that means is the car itself is going to become a commodity. And software is going to become king. And I want to connect this to an article I wrote about last week, which talked about the difference between hardware and software and Elon Musk in particular. I think Tesla is going to actually pull out of this okay. And I'm actually kind of disagreeing with the article I read from earlier, which talked about the, I guess, Tesla as a hardware company. When you really think about it, the Tesla... I think it's the Model S, but most of their models haven't changed in five or 10 years. They're not like Ford. They don't come out with a new vehicle every year. They're pretty static. They are basically a software company. And so I think that's really interesting. I think what GM is doing where they're building their own custom software is risky, but it might be the right move, right? They're not using Apple Car or, or yeah, no, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto or whatever it is. They're building their own bespoke software. And I, I thought it was a dumb bet, but it might, might be a necessary bet. They might be seeing this lever shift 
in a really prescient way. I'm not sure, but I think it's interesting to think about. This lever has lots of cool stuff to come out of it. All right, last but not we least, <laughs> I almost said weast, because so I was thinking of weak, is the idea of the weak. The idea is procrastination is emotional. I feel like I go through phases in life where I procrastinate a lot and phases where I am just all execution. And recently I've been procrastinating. And what I've realized is I just have this emotional backlog of stuff to deal with. And so often when I have that, my, my inclination is to try to work harder or design my environment better. But I don't think it really works. What I found is, you know, I try to eat, drink, stretch, clean, plan, do all these things to try to, you know, eliminate all the obstacles to work when really the obstacle is emotional. And I don't have a great process for fixing this or dealing with this yet. I'm trying to write down my emotions more often as I work. And that's somewhat helpful. But I think at the inside alone that the root cause is not necessarily a strategy, but an emotion is really interesting. And so I kind of encourage us to, when we're procrastinating, instead of feeling guilt or shame or trying to do other things, checking in emotionally. And I, I mean, I'm trying to do it. I'm not doing a great job, but I think it's interesting. And let me know if you get something out of it. Thank you so much for joining me on Last Week I Learned.